particularly in the Latin American continent, drug trafficking played an important role in the recent increase in, in homicide and the use of violence. We consider the efforts uh, uh, made by uh, uh, Mexico and uh, the family of victims, the 35 or 40,000 victims, well, we have to think about uh, the price that their family have paid, uh, is uh, certainly a laudable uh, uh, effort. So it's on the right track, basically? Absolutely, yes. Four years ago, Felipe Calderon uh, declared the war on drugs in Mexico. How do you see the situation after four years? Did it, did it improve or is it, better, is it worse? Well, I think there are some achievements that uh, we must recognize. But uh, I think that uh, considering the results, almost uh, 30,000 victims and extended violence uh, all around the country, portions of uh, the territory under control of organized uh, crime. What I think is that the strategies to uh, confront uh, organized crime have to be changed. Justo el informe de la ONU de 2011 menciona un incremento en la producción de marihuana en México considerable de alrededor del 25% de 2009 a 2010. También, por ejemplo, el área cultivada de amapola creció tremendamente, de manera que no, no se ve que, que haya ningún impacto en la producción o en la comercialización de drogas. Eh, la metanfetamina también ha crecido mucho en México. I don't see any progress. Uh, what you can see even in cities like where I'm from, you see two or three killings a day. If we would see violence reducing, more jobs, that's when you would say that we're winning the drug war. Muere mucha gente, ¿no? Eh, es, es muy, muy triste escuchar noticias, por ejemplo, que dos ciudades fronterizas que están pegadas, como es Ciudad Juárez y El Paso, Texas. En Estados Unidos, El Paso está declarada como la ciudad más segura de Estados Unidos y Ciudad Juárez es declarada desde 2008 como la ciudad más violenta del mundo. Ciudad Juárez, de ser una frontera próspera, eh, con una recaudación de impuestos muy importante para México, se está convirtiendo en una especie de pueblo vacío, sin, sin gente. La violencia va más allá de los asesinatos. La gente que es extorsionada, la gente que es secuestrada, la gente que es robada. Felipe Calderón, con su usual bravado, declaró this war on drugs without knowing what was going to come on him. He said, I'm going to be the, the drug lord's worst nightmare. Well, guess who's not sleeping these days? Um, I would think it's the president, but also many Mexicans. It's, it's a shame that many communities have to live with the terror and the lack of, of the minimum conditions of survival. Uh, young people who are using Twitter, for example, to report that don't go through that street in Monterrey because there's gunshots being fired, don't cross on that way because there's a bunch of unknown people holding the road, uh, don't go that way. I think Mexicans at some point need to say, hey, stop, we can't live this way. And when they tell us this is going to be a long fight and a prolonged fight and that we need to be patient, 
um, I disagree. Why should we be patient? I don't want to live my life uh, driving from work to home with a military truck next to me with a gun pointing to my head because that's the way they drive through the city. La violencia hoy en México, asociada a la delincuencia organizada, solamente puede ser explicada por esa fragmentación tanto del poder político como de la propia delincuencia organizada. Las primeras informaciones sobre mercado de drogas en México están desde el primer momento vinculadas al Estado mexicano, a gobernadores, a militares, a la policía como instituciones que al mismo tiempo han reprimido, pero también han protegido a la delincuencia organizada. La delincuencia organizada creció bajo la protección del Estado y el, el sistema político mexicano, que concentró mucho el poder por muchos años, mantuvo muy controlada la delincuencia organizada. Hacia ya el siglo XX tuvimos instituciones policiales como la Dirección Federal de Seguridad, que eran abiertamente administradores de mercados ilegales de droga, la propia policía. Cuando viene la transición democrática en México, se dan dos fenómenos. Crecimiento exponencial, crecimiento intenso de la delincuencia organizada a nivel global y fragmentación política en México. Es decir, se acabó el sistema de partido hegemónico, se acabó el régimen del PRI y empezamos a tener a nuevos grupos gobernando, nuevos partidos políticos gobernando y eso generó un fenómeno de autonomía del crimen organizado. Plan Colombia, aunque no ha podido contener la producción de, de ojo, planta de coca y de cocaína, pudo un tanto este, extirpar a los, a los grupos eh, organizados más fuertes de Colombia y lo que terminó haciendo es trasladando parte de ese poder a, a los grupos organizados de México. There are several parts of the country that have no state whatsoever and where organized crime is the the state or is the main actor uh, taking leadership and, and making decisions. In Mexico there are actually three two important cartels the Sinaloa cartel and the Zetas. Those are the most important because they have international connections and because they control the most uh, traffic on drugs from South America to USA. And uh, for example, in Sinaloa cartel, it's uh, controlling basically the most uh, of exportation of marijuana, but increasingly are, are getting uh, more strength, uh, stronger in the exportation of uh, methamphetamines. The Zetas control one part of cocaine and the trafficking, uh, the arms trafficking uh, from uh, USA to Mexico. And right now they're getting uh, control of the, all the Gulf uh, territory in Mexico. The Zetas were uh, the, uh, deserters from the Mexican army. They, uh, when they are part of the Mexican army, they get in train in USA and Israel for uh, terrorist tactics, uh, intelligence and counterintelligence tactics the Sinaloa cartel and the Zetas, they are the most important. They get in the, the most uh, important firepower also. So the confrontation in Mexico, actually right now it's getting between these two cartels. Ha continuado la lucha contra, el combate, contra la delincuencia organizada en general. Han, digamos, cortado muchas cabezas de los capos, de los delincuentes, de, digamos, de más arriba en la jerarquía delictiva. Y lo que ha sucedido es que muchos de estos grupos que estaban en medio o más abajo ya no tenían este, líderes que les estuvieran diciendo qué hacer, pero sin embargo ya, ya tenían el poder de fuego porque ya tenían las armas que les habían dado estos grupos, ya tenían alguna cierta capacitación, ya sabían 
cómo imponer el miedo en muchas comunidades. Y eso es lo que han hecho estos grupos. We have a bunch of young Mexicans without any perspective of future, without any aspiration to become anything other than rich, and whose lives don't matter to anybody. La procuración de justicia en nuestro país es muy endeble y esto ha propiciado eh, que mucha gente eh, vea esa situación como un campo propicio para ejercer actividades delictivas. There must be many different connections between cartels and, and the elites, not only political but also economic. It's not an unknown phenomenon that many families these days are marrying their daughters into drug trafficking families because that's a way to to acquire social mobility. Drug cartels are basically offering, hey, you know what, we're giving you a way of life. You're going to have money to feed your family, and I think that's the number one issue. Well, people are going to defend even the drug lords, right? If you have a drug lord that is the one who's taking care of uh, all the sewer problems in the small town, electricity, uh, finding other elements so people can live, That's why they become so powerful, because people depend on them. They started to provide services that the state, in all of its three levels of government, couldn't provide. Uh, we've heard of roads built by drug traffickers, we've heard of airports built by drug traffickers, we've heard of schools and clinics. So it's very hard to think that, again, this is something that floats and can be surgically removed with the army. This is something that has deep roots in Mexican society. Many parts of the society are accepting this way of life. In Mexico, contrary to what happened in the rest of Latin America, the army did not have a specific role in politics and bringing it in to combat drugs has given it some space in the political arena that, and it has been a very costly space in that political arena for the military because it has lost most of the prestige it had and it has also lost a lot of lives in a, in a war that is very difficult to win. The army is trained to fight a concrete enemy in a concrete situation of battle. That is not the way drug lords uh, work. They consider big achievements not only capturing drug lords, but killing drug lords. Uh, if this were a true um, democracy and if this were a true um, state with rule of law, you wouldn't need to kill people like in the Wild West, even if you're facing them in, in, in the context of war. Even in the context of war, there would be rules to deal with prisoners, there would be rules to deal with the enemy. And when they consider a big achievement, the killing of Nacho Coronel or the killing of the Beltran Leivas, well, I, I ponder and I say, well, excuse me, these people, even these people, as rotten as they were, if we buy that argument, deserved a fair trial um, and, and the whole thing that comes with the rule of law. Por un lado, tenemos una política bastante clara del gobierno de Estados Unidos y de México del combate al narcotráfico, pero por el otro lado hay un flujo de armamento que nutre a los cárteles de la droga. Las armas pasan de Estados Unidos a México sin el menor control posible. Hay toda una práctica ahí donde esto tiene históricamente eh, una validación de gobierno, de hecho es una fuente de ingresos bastante importante para ese país. Eh, desde la Revolución Mexicana, bueno, nos han dotado de armas para nutrir de, de todos estos instrumentos en la Revolución y hemos visto en otros países que le venden a un bando y a otro. I think that the US needs to check the issue with who they if they want to sell the weapons to their citizens, that's a decision that the US has and it's a second amendment right that they have. But I think you need to make it very difficult for those arms to be sold to people and then being smuggled into Mexico. It is impossible to believe that only Mexico has corruption and that is why the drug trafficking takes place. There has to be a counterpart in the United States for the drugs to be coming in the way they are. Do we have any estimations like how much money the Calderon government spent on the war on drugs since 2006? Or? Well, uh, one of the problems in Mexico to try to trace 
the budget uh, oriented to combat uh, drug trafficking in general is that uh, we don't have uh, access to that information uh, as a civil society. You don't know where, how they spent the money and you don't know where and in what. Some politicians have said that there needs to be a pact between government and drug cartels. I don't think that's the issue either. But I don't think that the issue is going and confronting them and fighting a war when you don't really have an alternative of how you're going to end that war and in how many years you're going to end that war. That's the problem with Felipe Calderón's tactics because he's basically fighting drugs, but he's not doing anything for better health, better education, more money for families, etc. Si se atacan las causas directas que ocasionan este crecimiento exponencial del, del narcotráfico, la pobreza, por ejemplo, la falta de educación, la falta de equidad entre la sociedad civil, se va a atacar indirectamente el problema del narcotráfico. No, no puedes generar paz en este país con las armas, no puedes generar paz en este país con la violencia. Es una regla lógica, violencia genera violencia. La muerte genera muertes. Sacamos a policías que no saben ni siquiera resolver un conflicto entre dos personas que chocan el automóvil. No saben, prefieren irse. Personas que han usado dos veces su arma en un año y que están enfrente de un sujeto que usa su arma diario. Los matan. Los matan. Primera solución, dignificación policial. Esto requiere inversión. Hay que invertir en la policía en México. Nuestro gobierno no necesita más armas, creo yo. No necesita más policías, no necesita más jueces, no, necesita más confianza. Confianza es, tiene que ver con transparencia. Necesitas un cambio de paradigma para usar el dinero de otra manera. Por cada peso que se gaste en la policía, en prisiones, en fiscales, en jueces, por cada peso, por cada dólar, se debe gastar un peso en prevención social del delito, lo cual incluye tratamiento, educación. Cultura de legalidad, cultura ciudadana, o sea, empoderar al ciudadano. Hay que dejar de empoderar al Estado y empezar a empoderar al ciudadano. Eso es lo que quisiera que entendiera la gente de Naciones Unidas, ¿no? que el costo de la guerra contra las drogas se está pagando en estos países. Y, y en los países desarrollados no, no, se, no se ve, digamos, de manera real que vaya a, a parar el consumo. Nos están condenando a seguir teniendo huérfanos, nos están condenando a seguir teniendo violencia en nuestras calles y sobre todo nos están condenando, irónicamente, a, a que aumente el consumo de drogas en nuestros países porque se ha demostrado que una de las cosas que más produce el acercamiento a las drogas por parte de las personas es el estrés postraumático derivado de, de experiencias de violencia. There are drug users and Mexico is, you know, not only a transit country but also a producer country and a consumer country. The idea that drug users are criminals and the idea that drug use is associated directly with organized crime is still an idea that is out there and we need to change that if we are to respond in a different way. Uh, many people are afraid of responding, you know, offering treatment, offering prevention strategies, even offering harm reduction. Not as much because of what harm reduction entails, but because they think, you know, what we're doing is fostering organized crime. You have to divide the world, the, the world of the drugs from the world of the crime and then focus on crime, organized crime in a very different approach the state has to gain again the control of the market, you know, making regulation of it. And that's, that's the point where we are. We are proposing regulations for dif different drug markets in Mexico. Hace 10 años, pues prácticamente éramos tomados por locos. Y ahora mucha gente está dándose cuenta de que es una, una alternativa plausible el hecho de despenalizar la cannabis y de regularla en este caos que tenemos actualmente. Is there any political support for the idea of legalization in Mexico? 
I think there are politicians that have started to talk about the issue of legalizing drugs. Some drugs, not all drugs. And I think we need to debate that. What types of drugs should be legalized? And what are the consequences? Are they going to be paying taxes for that? What is that money on taxes going to be used for? And I think education on not to use drugs should be the issue. I'm not saying that we should legalize all drugs, but I think we need to debate and see what are going to be the consequences if we do that, uh, if that's going to resolve any of the problems. El problema se acaba cuando la droga se legaliza. Yo no lo pensaría igual. Creo que esa ilusión a lo mejor puede ser una puerta falsa. Porque sabemos que el crimen organizado igual vende marihuana, igual secuestra. Si le quitamos el mercado de la marihuana, de la marihuana igual se incrementa. Otra dinámica de extorsión, de secuestro, de crimen. Entonces, yo no estaría tan claro y tan cierto de que legalizando la marihuana disminuye la violencia. La cannabis sigue siendo el 60% alrededor, alrededor del 60% de los ingresos de los grupos que se dedican al, al tráfico de drogas. Entonces, retirarles esa, esa fuente de ingresos eh, necesariamente haría merma en su, en su capacidad de fuego y en su poder corruptor. We have to discuss legalization of uh, different drugs and that this has to be also discussed widely discussed in the United States. And in this case, I think we should adopt common policies if we want to be effective in the results to obtain. In 2012, we have a new government coming, coming into place at the presidency level. Um, we don't have too high expectations of them, but we need to learn from the past, you know, very failed experiment that we had with the, with the war on drugs. And we want to make sure that all these opinions, the debate that, that has been opened, it continues to be there and that we use that and, and move forward and not stay there.